thank you all for joining us. And again, my apologies, I just finished teaching. Uh, so what I'll do is introduce Hema very quickly, and then we're gonna give Hema an opportunity to present her work. And then I'm gonna, uh, I don't know, say, uh, make some comments and raise some questions in about 12 minutes after her presentation. So uh, starting with the introduction, Hema Club Santa Maria is an assistant professor of Latin American history at Loyola University in Chicago, and she specializes in issues related to violence, religion, and state formation in Mexico and Central America. In the year 2017, 2018, she was with us as a visiting fellow with the Kellogg Institute, where she wrote and finished writing her amazing book that we're gonna discuss today, a Vortex of Violence, Lynching, Extra Legal Justice, and the State in Revolutionary Mexico published with the University of California Press in 2020. Uh, she's also the lead editor of a couple of books, also on the same topic, Violence and Crime in Latin America, Representations and Politics with the University of Oklahoma Press, 2017, and Human Security and Chronic Violence in Mexico, New Perspectives and Proposals from Below with Editorial Corrua in 2019. Uh, more, most recently, uh, she has published uh, articles on the Journal of Latin American Studies, Latin American Research Review, The Americas, and she also contributed uh, a chapter with an edited volume that I published uh, last, last year, Mexico Beyond uh, 1968, uh, with the University of Arizona Press. So thank you, Gemma, for joining us. We look forward to your discussion. Uh, so why don't we just present the book to us, and then again, uh, I'll follow up with some comments and with a number of questions that I prepare for our discussion. So thank you again for, for, for coming back, uh, if I, at least this way with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jaime, for your kind words and your presentation. And, and I want to begin actually by thanking Professor Jaime Pensado, as well as um, Kellogg Institute Assistant Director Denise Wright for the opportunity to share my work with you today. Uh, it is a particular pressure to present my work at the Kellogg uh, because, as Jaime say, said, this is an institution that gave me the space, the time to finish this book, to complete this book, and I'm so glad to see my editor, editor Kate Marshall. Uh, it was wonderful to work with UC Press. In the Vortex of Violence examines the history of lynching during the formative decades of the post-revolutionary period. Through the examination of more than 300 cases, of lynching. The book analyzes the impact that Mexico's process of state formation, together with religion, perceptions of crime, and mythical beliefs had in the organization and legitimation of this practice. Lynching is a collective, public, and particularly cruel form of violence aimed at punishing behaviors considered threatening or, or, threatening or deviant by members of a given community. Far from being purely impulsive or irrational, Lynchings constitute significant political acts that are grounded in long-term historical processes and intercommunity conflicts. Today, I would like to focus my presentation on the relationship between lynching and state formation in post-revolutionary Mexico. Discussing this relationship will allow me to highlight three of the main arguments of the book. Of the book. First, that lynching did not express an absence of the state, but rather the presence of a state that was considered abusive arbitrary and illegitimate. Second, that lynching escapes binary, top-down or bottom-up characterizations of violence, representing instead a form of social control directed against people that threaten the status quo from witches, socialists, Protestants, and representatives of the state. And thirdly, that lynching was not only driven by impunity, although this certainly was an important aspect, but also by people's demands for corporal, swift and extra legal forms of punishment. So let me begin. In the last scene of Emilio Fernandez's film, Maclovia, we see the two protagonists, Jose Maria and Maclovia, being chased by a mob of angry indigenous villages carrying torches. Encircled by the mob and with nowhere to go, Jose Maria and Maclovia embrace each other as the group of women, men, and elderly throw stones at them with the clear intention of lynching them. As the dramatic music escalates, the leading characters are saved by a group of soldiers from the Federal Army headed by Cabo Mendoza. In perfect synchrony, the soldiers raise their bayonets and fire shots into the air. 
We then hear Cabo Mendoza, who is standing between the mob and the mortified couple, admonishes the crowd. Your traditions, or whatever those are, have made you commit a great injustice. But the troops will give protection to these two innocents so they can get out of here. The camera then shows the couple leaving the town behind, dark and full of flaming torches, navigating into a clear horizon. As suggested by this retelling of the film's closing scene, Maclovia, juxtaposes the unruly, communal, and savage violence of the Indian crowd to the discipline, bureaucratic, and modern use of force of the Mexican state. Representative of the indigenista films directed by Fernandez, Maclovia sheds lights into the ways in which the post-revolutionary state came to be imagined as a civilizing force that through its cultural and economic policies, as well as through its legal use of force, had the mission to incorporate and modernize communities that would otherwise be trapped in ignorance, poverty, and religious fanaticism. The reference to lynching in these and other influential films of the time is not accidental. Lynching fitted nicely into a narrative that opposed the modernizing impetus of the state to the backwardness and so-called barbarity of communities that were, for the most part, rural. And yet, an analysis of lynching set against the many expressions of violence perpetrated by state authorities and public officials during these years reveals that such a dichotomous narrative of a state formation, one that construes the state as modern and communities as unruly and backward is problematic and ultimately wrong. In the following minutes, I will examine several cases of lynching that involve state actors and local authorities, either as victims or perpetrators of more violence. Although lynching did not always involve figures of authority, the cases that relate to such actors elucidate with greater clarity the dynamics of negotiation, resistance, and accommodation that characterize the country's process of state making. In general terms, I identified three modalities of lynching. Lynching as resistance, lynching as corrective justice, and state-sanctioned lynchings. I will divide my presentation into three sections, each covering one modality of lynching. The first modality, lynching as resistance, refers to attacks that targeted those actors that represented the state's efforts to modernize and secularize local communities. In this case, lynching emerges as a means to resist the encroachment of the post-revolutionary state into communal life, as well as to assert communities' right to decide over matters such as education, religion, sanitation, and land distribution. Counter to what sociological theories would predict, these lynchings illustrate that the greater presence of state authorities at the local level did not bring about a decrease in extralegal and overt forms of violence. One of the clearest manifestations of this modality was the lynching of dozens of female and male teachers in different states of Mexico between 1934 and 1940. The attacks were driven by the enactment of a new educational policy promoted by the federal government which that dictated that education would be socialist and aim at defanaticized religious believers. Socialist education was central to Mexico's process of state making. Through its implementation, central elites sought to modernize and assimilate rural and indigenous communities, as well as to implement an agrarian reform at a national level. Socialist education threatened both the spiritual and material dimension of Catholics' exercise of religion. The anti-clerical and iconoclast actions carried out by more than a few socialist teachers, which included the warning of religious images, as well as the use of churches as stables, prompted violent responses among the faithful. In a small town in the northern state of Durango, for instance, two teachers who asked their students to deny the existence of God were found dead in the town's main plaza. The female teacher asked students to greet her by saying, there is no God while the male teacher told students that he urinated in God. Sometime later, she was found naked, raped, and with her breast mutilated. The male teacher was found castrated. On his body, the perpetrators left a note that said, so you do not go around being on God. Catholic mobs and groups of vigilantes responded to teachers' defilement of religious images symbols and practices, not only by threaten, threatening them with violence, but also by mutilating and marking their bodies. The mutilation of ears was salient amongst the forms of violence used against teachers, as were hangings and to a lesser extent, warning, warnings. 
A picture of sisters Micaela and Enriqueta Palacios published in newspaper Excelsior in 1935, wearing heavy bandages around their heads, shows the powerful message that the mutilation of ears of teachers sent to others regarding the potential consequences of imparting socialist education. The federal government tried to counter this opposition by supporting the work of teachers and by honoring their sacrifice. In 1939, for instance, Mexico's education ministry published a collection of lithographs created by graphic artist Leopoldo Mendez. Each lithograph depicted vividly the murder of a rural teacher at the hands of people that opposed socialist education. The lithographs presented the various forms of torment endured by teachers and portrayed them as victims and martyrs of people's ignorance. A flyer printed in 1938, also authored by Mendes, depicted a defenseless, defenseless and badly injured teacher surrounded by several attackers. Among other things, the flyer accompanying text read, Teacher, you are alone against the ignorant, provoked by the rich, the slander that poisons and breaks your relations with the pueblo. In tune with media and official representations at the time, Mendes' reference to villagers' opposition to socialist education as an expression of their ignorance concealed the political and practical reasons that led people to oppose socialist education, including communities' reject rejection of the agrarian reform and of the central state's interference in local affairs. Teachers were not the only representatives of the state whose presence was challenged by communities. While the state was eventually forced to abandon socialist education, lynchings against alcohol inspectors, tax collectors, federal doctors, and military personnel revealed the existence of a pattern of opposition and resistance towards the central state. During the 1940s, two policies stood out in terms of the level of opposition that they encountered at the local level, military conscription and the campaign to eradicate the food and mouth disease. Enthusiastically embraced by central elites in the context of Mexico's entry into World War II, military conscription was highly unpopular among the rural poor. The abuse and corruption of recruitment committees and municipal authorities contributed to its rejection. In December of 1942, in Tuxtepec, Oaxaca, a group of female villagers attempted to lynch a military inspector and all the members of the recruitment committee. Letters of complaint written by mothers of young soldiers reveal these women's reasons to oppose conscription. In these letters, mothers complain about members of the military taking their children by force, dragging them, and I quote, as if they were animals, in order to comply with the mand mandatory military service. On September of 1947, another incident concerning military members took place in the town of Sengyu, Michoacán. The incident involved hundreds of female and male teachers peasants who armed with machetes, stones, and various sharp objects, lynched a veterinary doctor and all members of his military escort. The doctor was part of a sanitary brigade that in collaboration with the US government sought to eradicate the food and mouth virus that had infected Mexican cattle in 1946. The eradication campaign, which privileged the killing of infected animals over the application of vaccines was violently opposed by Mexican peasants. Although government officials again portrayed this incident as a result of people's ignorance, popular opposition to the eradication campaign was actually grounded in rather pragmatical, con pragmatic considerations, such as peasants' reliance on their cattle for food and for work in their land. Peasants' demands for a more moderate approach actually dealt eventually to the government abandoning this policy and to privilege vaccinations instead of massive slaughter. By the 1950s, lynchings organized as a reaction to the encroachment of the central state had receded significantly, reflecting the cumulative effect of dynamics of resistance and accommodation characterized in prior decades. The lynching of public officials, however, did not wither away. The second modality I want to examine refers precisely to lynchings that targeted officials and power figures that were either the jury or de facto responsible for enforcing social control within communities. These lynchings reflected people's discontent towards the behavior of officials that had in their view abused their power. In other words, these lynchings were meant as a corrective of the behavior of these actors, be them crooked politicians, abusive majors, or policemen that engage in criminal and violent conducts. 
on July of, 14, of 1932, for instance, in Puebla City, a policeman was nearly lynched by a group of people who witnessed how this guardian of law and order had shot a, sales, a newspaper salesman. After the victim was shot, a group of bystanders who felt outraged by the behavior of the policeman attempted to lynch him armed with the stones and daggers. The attempt of lynching of this Puebla City policeman was not isolated. Directed mainly against police officers, these lynchings were also perpetrated against soldiers, majors, and caciques whose behavior was considered wrongful or abusive. That citizens could retaliate against office, police officers' transgressions sheds light on the complex nature of police society relations. It shows that citizens were not merely passive observers of police abuse, even when the police had the upper hand in this relationship. In August of 1944, for instance, neighbors from the town of Tecoala in Nayarit attempted to lynch three policemen in retaliation for the murder of two traveling salesmen. Although the policemen had been in prison for their crime, people tried to break into the penitentiary in order to lynch the culprits. Similar events were reported elsewhere, but with cases taking place not only in small towns, but also in urban settings, where bystanders and curious witnesses felt compelled to act even if they barely knew the victims of police abuse. A case in point was the attempt of lynching of policeman Treviño Martinez in August of 1943 in Mexico City. Treviño Martinez had shot two men, allegedly in self-defense. It was only after seeing his life in danger, or so he claimed, that he had decided to shoot them. Distrustful of his version of the incident and convinced that he was the aggressor, a group of neighbors severely beat Tre Treviño Martinez in retaliation for the double murder. Although these lynchings enabled citizens to retaliate authorities' abuse of power, their tactics ended up reproducing the excessive use of violence that they allegedly sought to correct. A parallel argument can be made in the case of lynchings perpetrated against mayors and caciques. The lynching of these power figures signaled villagers' feelings of anger and distress provoked by years of political abuse, manipulation, and exploitation. A case of particular significance given the visibility it acquired at the time, was the lynching of Aquila de la Peña, the cacique of Ciudad Hidalgo, Michoacán, in 1959. Former President Lázaro Cárdenas himself traveled to the town right after the lynching and attended the funeral of de la Peña, who was a political ally and a close friend of his. Of his. The case was documented and later fictionalized by journalist Fernando Benítez in his 1961 novel, novel El Agua, envenenada, the poison water. The lynching was provoked by a rumor that claimed that the cacique had poisoned the water of Ciudad Hidalgo. Although the rumor was false, it was credible enough to spark the anger of villagers who had for years resented the actions of the cacique and his pistoleros. After a villager died due to food poisoning, the rumor of the poison water spread like wildfire. People headed towards the cacique's house armed with stones, pistols, and petrol bombs. The cacique responded shooting the villagers with his machine gun, killing two of them. People's anger escalated. A multitude of men, women, and even children lynched the cacique. In the frenzy of events, people shot at the cacique's horses, plucked and killed his peacocks, and set fire on his house. As the killing of Aquiles de la Peña makes clear, people regarded lynching as a form of justice that could allow them to redress, redress the wrongs by those who, had, who were in positions of power. Citizens, however, were not alone in embracing this form of violence. The third and last modality of lynching I want to discuss refers to cases perpetrated by, or in conjunction with, state authorities, mainly majors, but also soldiers and police officers. These cases entail the collaboration between public officials and citizens who, in the face of an alleged criminal or wrongdoer, consider lynching a legitimate form of punishment. On May of 1930, for instance, the press reported a triple lynching perpetrated in the town of Tepetzala in Puebla. The three victims, who were merchants from a neighboring town, were wrongly accused of stealing a few chickens that belonged to the local cacique. After identifying them as the alleged wrongdoers, a group of men and women surrounded the men, beat them badly, and dragged them to the municipal offices. Once there, the mayor rang the town's church bells in order to summon more villages. While in the presence of a growing crowd, the mayor gave the order of hanging the men from a tree. 
The crowd completed the lynching armed with pistol stones and knives. The lynching of these three merchants brings to light the ways in which local authorities, instead of upholding the rule of law, sanctioned the use of mob violence. As a matter of fact, lynchings were part of a broader repertoire of extralegal forms of violence used by majors, police officers, and military in post-revolutionary Mexico. Such repertoire included the use of torture to fabricate suspects and repress political dissidents, as well as the killings of suspected criminals op upon their alleged attempt to escape the law, the practice known as ley fuga. In contrast to torture and ley fuga, however, lynching offered the possibility of making an extrajudicial killing look like a commun communal act of justice. It also offered the anonymity and seeming impunity of more violence, which based on its collective nature was often attributed to the pueblo rather than to single perpetrators. Lynchings organized or perpetrated with the clear acquiescence of public officials continued during the 1940s, demonstrated the continuity of a practice that translated into authorities' failure to protect citizens. The lynching of Simón García in 1940 in the town of Quecholac in Puebla is particularly telling of the vulnerability of people who not only lacked protection from authorities, but were also exposed to mob violence by public officials. In a letter addressed to the president, Simón García's widow and sister denounced the mayor for having instigated the lynching. After hauling him into his office, the mayor unarmed Simón and then proceeded to turn him over to a mob of close to 30 people armed with clubs, machetes, and daggers. The mob stabbed and struck Simon to death. It then paraded his dead body through the streets of the town. In the letter, the women asserted the mayor had no right to have sent the Simons to be lynched by the pueblo and cited Article 17 of the Constitution, which established that no person could take justice into their own hands. It would be tempting to see these and other cases involving municipal authorities as expressions of some atavistic traditions that belong to a distant rural world, world rather than to the political maneuvering of central elites. However, the pervasiveness of these abusive practices suggests that at the very least, central elites took a conscious decision to neglect their occurrence. Furthermore, the fact that several abusive and cacique-like individuals build up their political career precisely based on their use of coercion, suggests this type of behavior was not only passively accepted as a necessity, but it was actually actively sought as a means to give the regime a level of cohesiveness and stability. So long as they remain loyal to the regime and so long as the abuses did not attract unnecessary publicity, Central elites tolerated and even rewarded a strong men's use of extralegal forms of violence. As argued at the beginning of this presentation, a narrative of state making that construes the state as a civilizing force that has the mission to tame the violence of unruly and backward communities is problematic and ultimately wrong. Although the overt participation of public officials in the organization of lynchings receded during the 1950s decade, public official sanctioning of extralegal forms of violence was far from over. And examples abound. In Guerrero, Veracruz, several other states, people were tortured, hung, mutilated by police officers under the orders of majors, police officers, local caciques. The cases of lynchings I analyze today bring into question a narrative of a state building that predicts that the greater presence of the state at the local level will bring about a decrease in extralegal, overt and public forms of violence. They furthermore illustrate that lynching did not signal a state absence, but the presence of a state considered arbitrary, illegitimate, and abusive. Rather than being symptomatic of the so-called backwardness of communities, lynching was a reflection of the ways in which a state authority was forged at the local level with the acquiescence of a state and federal elites in post-revolutionary Mexico. The persistency and pervasiveness of lynching in Mexico and other Latin American countries up to this day calls for an analysis of the long-term effects that these nation's processes of state formation have had in the perpetuation and legitimation of these acts. The history of this practice in post-revolutionary Mexico can help us illuminate the cultural, political, and historical drivers behind the ongoing legitimacy of lynching in Mexico and in Latin America at large. Thank you.
and I will stop sharing my screen uh, and, and Jaime, please. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gemma, and congratulations. And, and thank you for such a wonderful presentation. Uh, it's a great book. Um, uh, in the vertex of violence, in fact, it's a remarkable historical study of the phenomenon of lynching in Mexico during the post-revolutionary period of the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, when the so-called radical administration of Lázaro Cárdenas was replaced by more conservative and authoritarian presidential administrations that moved the state further to the right and closer, to some extent, to the Catholic Church, so history tells us. Uh, defined as a collective, brutal, and overt form of violence, HEMA examines lynching as a window into Mexico's past, mostly to study the often fragile process of state formation, government accountability or lack thereof, and popular notions of justice, power, and political negotiation. It is, in some ways, a fascinating book that indirectly makes important contributions to the field of caciquismo a scholarship which thrived during the 1960s and 70s when the benefits of the economic miracle were questioned uh, by many, many scholars and the violence of the state was exposed to the public with the Tlatelolco massacre. It is also a scholarship uh, that saw a revisionist phase recently in the last 10 to 20 years when the PRI lost its power for the very first time. Specifically, this revisionist scholarship of caciquismo successfully questioned one simplistic descriptions of the Mexican state, often described as monolithic Leviathan power. Instead, like Hema's book, this literature has described the hegemony of the state as an often fragile, yet authoritarian power, which almost always had to share its rising control of the nation with competing power brokers or caciques uh, active within and outside the apparatus of the government, as well as with disgruntled sectors of society. Similarly, in, in her discussion of the Catholic Church, Hema successfully draws attention to multiple competing actors who compose the ecclesiastical authorities in general and ordinary Catholics in particular. And in so doing, she successfully questioned the post-Cristero period, not entirely as a peaceful moment of the Tente in Mexican history, but instead she explains with great detail how and why ordinary people relied on lynching as a form of resistance and protest on the one hand, and as a political discourse of engagement on the other. In this sense, ordinary actors are never described in the book as irrational dupes uh, who were manipulated by church and state agents as so often described in the scholarship but instead as conscious individuals with clear understandings of the behaviors, practices, and beliefs that shaped multiple forms of lynchings. The reasons for participating in lynchings vary significantly and cannot be attributed to one single case, Hema further demonstrates. While some actors engage in this violent act to protest the impunity of the judicial system and the disparaging economic inequality that they face, Others did so as a means to attain justice, punish transgressions, or individuals who were considered offensive, sacrilegious, corrupt, threatening, foreign, or, or immoral. Yet others engage in collective forms of violence to call into question the rising projects of modernity that emerged after the revolution, whether these were represented by rising fears and anxieties related to the presence of socialist teachers or to the implementation of conscription campaigns, sanitation programs, or, or secularization projects at large. In this sense, Hema successfully argues that lynching reflected the moving dynamics of negotiation and accommodation between citizens and political and religious authorities. Lynching, moreover, emerged as a liable discourse and a form of representation at a time which has been traditionally but mistakenly described in the scholarship of modern Mexico as relatively peaceful. There was little Pax Perista during the so-called golden years of the economic miracle, in other words. In making these and additional arguments, Hema divides her book into four chapters each describing the complexities, paradoxes, contradictions, and competing figures associated with the phenomenon of lynching. Uh, 
from state agents and popular actors in the first chapter to religious figures and ecclesiastical authorities in the second chapter to journalists and readers of the crime pages of Nota Roja in the press in chapter three and competing sectors of society and believers of popular myths in the, in the final fourth chapter. In describing the competing rationale that influenced multiple actors in the participation of collective forms of violence, Hema examined more than 300 cases of lynching, mostly in central Mexico, in the populated areas of Mexico City, Puebla, and El Estado de Mexico. Besides newspapers, she also relied on letters, security reports, surveillance documents, and films, as well as on religious images and artifacts. But besides written texts and images, and this is where I think Hema's work shines the most, she also and, and innovatively takes into consideration mythical beliefs, religious attitudes, popular understandings of politics, the circulation of rumors, spaces, and competing political behaviors. In this sense, the book is remarkably and successfully interdisciplinary in its methods and always co uh, comparative in its scope. Um, her central argument, in short, is twofold. First is that the impunity, corruption, and the abuse of force became structural and systematic during the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, rather than exceptional or abnormal. Second is that although lynching was rampant and present in multiple spheres, it specifically targeted the most vulnerable individuals considered at the fringes of society. Hence, uh, in the aftermath of the revolution and the Cristero Rebellion, lynching emerged as an acceptable and at times even preferred form of punishment on the one hand and as a tool of social control on the other. In Hema's words, and I quote, lynching was at the epicenter of the politics of state making in post-revolutionary Mexico, end of quote. Yet the political stability that characterized this period was, and I quote again, not the result of a steady and successful process of centralization of violence, but was actually built on a plural and decentralized exercise of violence, coercion, and the precarious rule of law, end of quote. In sum, competing public officials and police offers Use, uh, officers use lynching to exercise social and political control in given disgruntled and often vulnerable communities. At the same time, ordinary citizens who lacked real institutional power relied on collective and public forms of violence to resist uh, the presence of competing power brokers, including state agents, and or preserve the religious status quo of their respective communities. Overall, it is a fascinating historical account, in short, of Mexico that makes key contributions to our understanding of state formation, power, and resistance. So it's a, it's a magnificent book. So thank you, Gemma, for sharing it. And, uh, and rather than me sort of uh, um, laying out additional arguments that you make, what I want to do is pose uh, four questions that I hope uh, can get us started with, with our discussion. And these are general questions. Feel free to ignore them, but I just want to get the discussion started. So my first question has to do with the issue of continuity and change over time. Uh, in your conclusion, you write, and I quote, the violence Me uh, Mexico is experiencing today has deep roots in the country's tra trajectory of state building and the citizens' understanding of extra-legal violence as a legitimate form of justice, end of quote. And uh, while I agree and find your argument convincing, as a historian of the Cold War, I wonder what your findings can tell us about state building and extra-legal violence during the 1960s and 70s, and, and, and perhaps it's not a fair question. Uh, but, but nonetheless, I, I hope you can maybe kind of entertain that question. Uh, in your book, you end, for instance, in the 1950s, when the narrative of the Cold War is already on the rise and shaping a narrative, after all. Yet I find it surprising that you did not use the term the Cold War at all in your book. The background is always post-revolutionary Mexico and not rising Cold War Mexico, if you will. And at the end of your book, you also trace the dirty war to the post-1960 period. But as a new generation of historians have recently argued, including a couple of figures that we have here, uh, uh, like Gladys McCormick, right, but also Camilo Vicente Ovalle, among many others, they argue that the origins of Mexico's dirty war can actually be traced back to the 1940s. Um, similarly, uh, in an earlier book by Gil Joseph and Greg Grandin, 
uh, they pushed historians of Latin America to rethink the long history of the Cold War, right? By taking a closer look at the violent uh, years that took, uh, uh, that took place during the third, first three decades of the 20th century. Now, do you agree with this and similar arguments considering the emphasis that you give in your book to the 1940s and 50s? And if not, what can you speculate and perhaps explain uh, what, you can, um, what you can tell us about your fascinating study of, of lynching, right? What does it tell us about uh, you know, the, the 60s and 70s when things only get heated? Period, in other words. So that's my first, my first question. Uh, the second is a related one. And, uh, and as I noted in my comments earlier, your book reminds me a great deal of the literature on caciquismo. Specifically, some of the most fascinating studies that I have read on the subject are a series of articles written lately by uh, Will Pansters, for instance, who see the 1940s as a moment in which uh, Mexico experienced new and more modern, uh, paradoxically speaking, forms of caciquismo, right? At a moment in which the nation's population moved from rural to more urban centers. In schools, including universities, for example, caciquismo remained strong despite efforts by education authorities to get rid of violence as a tool of social control and negotiation. In my own work, I see uh, this uh, with the emergence of, of populism or the use of action for mechanism of control. Uh, in, in fact, during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, there were numerous cases in which students were actually lynched inside uh, universities. Um, so uh, for the state, this form of violence became convenient. And in fact, government authorities often relied on the use of apocryphal news to exaggerate the levels of violence inside schools, but also in, in other places. Their goal was to emphasize the alleged violence perpetrated by and against students, and hence an exaggerated and even fictitious account of lynchings was successfully used as an excuse to bring law and order inside the universities. So in other words, the stories published in the press often sided with the government and thus called, I think, for great scrutiny from the historians. In this, is this something that you experience with your own reading of, of the newspaper accounts, I guess is my question. Or put differently, were cases of lynching ever portrayed in a fictitious manner to manipulate political events or repress social movements? Overall, can you comment a bit more on the methodological use of the sources if you have the time? Uh, my third question is again related to the historical changes that took place during the 1940s. As I noted earlier, the background of your story is always post-revolutionary Mexico, but not Cold War or modern Mexico, which is the other kind of category that we often kind of use, right? Yet the 1940s also witnessed a moment of great social, cultural, and political transition. Uh, besides the urbanization of the country, for example, that I mentioned earlier, we also see the emergence of new institutions of repression, as well as new extra-legal mechanisms of control. This is a time to, to give some examples when the Granaderos or the riot police were created, the Dirección Federal de Seguridad was founded, and Charismo in the labor sector uh, and other forms of mechanisms of control were institutionalized. Um, again, just to reference some examples, uh, to what extent do these new, allegedly more modern mechanisms of control, surveillance, and negotiation influence or even shape the history of lynching in Mexico during this period. Um, uh, finally, my, um, yeah, my, my last question has to do with lynching as a spectacle. Uh, in, your in your book, you do a great job to talk about lynching as a discourse, and instead of describing this form of collective violence strictly as a mechanism overimposed from above or spontaneously erupted from below, you successfully put the emphasis in the competing logics and paradoxes associated with, with lynching. And I think in many ways, this is what makes your book great. Uh, you also explain how people were killed during the lynchings with painful detail and argue that the methods of killing matter, uh, whether these people were hanged, burned alive, mutilated, or dragged before they were collectively and publicly executed. Yet I wonder to what extent lynching can also be read as a spectacle 
or as a form of public theater, I suppose, which meaning has changed over time. Uh, and let me provide you with an example of, of what I mean. Uh, currently, I am reading a fascinating book titled uh, Revolution in the Terra de Sol on Brazilian film during the Cold War, in which the author examines how and why militant filmmakers of the 1960s revisited the lynching or killing of Canudos, the, Northern, the Northeast rebels of Brazil, not as, a, not as faceless victims of a backward nation, but as martyrs of a continuous and still alive revolution against multiple manifestations of colonialism. Uh, similarly, in, in, you know, in, in Mexico, uh, I see how a new generation of activists in the 1960s revisit the, uh, the legacy of the Cristero Rebellion, and in doing so, they rediscover people who were lynched during the 1920s and reimagined them as martyrs of Catholic militancy and rebellion of, of, of the 60s. Um, the lynching that took place in the past, in other words, were metaphorically performed later on in, in, in subsequent decades. And in this process, the collected violent acts were given new meanings. Is this something that you saw with your own cases? I guess that's my question. That is, lynching as a performance of an earlier era. Overall, is there a theatrical aspect of lynching that shaped political behavior that, that you might comment on? Did the left, for instance, in Mexico create martyrs of those who were lynched uh, to incite a momentum uh, for, their, for their movements? Uh, so these are some questions. Thank you so much. Uh, and I hope these are useful and I hope these generate uh, a larger discussion. So again, feel free to ignore them or just to answer one of them. <laughs> thank you so much, Jaime. These are wonderful, wonderful, wonderful questions. And, and, and I really thank you for your generous comments as well uh, on, the, on the book, on the project. And, 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 I, and indeed, I want to reiterate that this book was made possible by Kellogg, by my fellowship there. And, and Jaime was next to me, you know, our offices next to each other. So he knows this project and has heard about it probably way too much. And I, so your questions are all very relevant and very, uh, you, know, you know, push me to think about uh, several issues. Uh, so let me try to address them, some of them together. So, so in terms of the question about the, the Cold War, no? I mean, what does the book tell us about the Cold War? I mean, I will begin by saying that I agree with, uh, with scholars that have pushed us to think about the long Cold War, no? I mean, that trace the origins of the Cold War or that actually frame the Cold War as a period that begins in the 1930s, 1940s, for the case of Mexico, for sure. Um, and I have, uh, as a matter of fact, written elsewhere about the connections uh, specifically between the lynchings against socialist teachers during the 1930s and lynching that took place in the 1960s, no? Specifically, and you know about this because uh, in my contribution to the book that you edited, I reflect a little bit on the lynching that took place in Canoa uh, in September of 1968 against five university workers of the Universidad Autónoma de Puebla who are accused uh, by the priest of this town, Canoa in Puebla, of being communist students. So there is a lot of connections, I mean, in, in, in terms of the the anti-communist spirit that informs those lynchings in the 1930s to this one that takes place in the 1960s, as well as to the overall sense of distrust and, and, and paranoia in terms of outsiders, people that were perceived as, as dangerous to the, to the stability and cohesiveness of the community, but also to the purity of the nation, no? I mean, to the purity of the nation and that were perceived also as being a foreign element, elements, no? I mean, in the 1950s uh, is like Protestant, but also communist. So I see definitely like this, this, this history that I'm presenting here uh, as giving us the precursors of this violence that comes in the 1960s uh, more clearly. Uh, and I see a, a, a genealogy of, if you will, no? I mean, in terms of the Actually, some of the same towns where these lynchings happened in, in Puebla in the 1930s again happened in the 1960s. No? So you see these uh, types of sentiments uh, being carried over from one decade to the next. Um, one of the things that I, um, that I think it's interesting, though, is how, again, the, the overt participation, and this connects to the, I think, was your third question uh, regarding the institutionalization or the quote unquote modernization of violence with the creation of these uh, institutions of repression by the, by the Mexican state. 
So interestingly, there is a decline in terms of the overt participation of state officials in the organization of lynchings. So we do not see, like beginning in the second half of the 1950s, there are no police officers of, or majors participating overtly in the organization of lynching. But as I mentioned in the book, this doesn't mean that the violence become sorry, that the state violence becomes less brutal. No, I mean, it might happen in the private doors of the prison cell, no, I mean, but it entails torture, it entails uh, mutilation as well, disappearances, um, and also like the use of these proxy actors, no, I mean, the, the, the agents provocateurs that you have studied in your work, no, and so the, the use of state violence might have become less overt in terms of lynchings, and lynching kind of like in the 1960s becomes like this more clearly like this this form of violence perpetrated by non-state actors no the way that is uh, uh, understood today but again this doesn't mean that the state is 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 not continuing to commit these atrocities and also it doesn't mean that there is not a political dimension of lynching or that lynching cannot be instrumentalized by political actors even today no even though is usually just a frame as a form of crime control, I would claim that there's also a very political uh, message and, and, and a story behind many of the lynchings that take place in Mexico today. Let me comment briefly on methodology because that's always like a question that we like as a historians. Uh, so, so newspapers were central for, uh, for the narrative that I that articulate in the book. Um, I use also letters, letters of complaint security reports, uh, a few cases, judicial, uh, judicial archives were not so helpful because lynching is not typified as a crime in Mexico, but nevertheless, there were some that did make it to the Supreme Court and, and I studied those as well. So newspapers most definitely had an interest in sensationalizing these cases, I mean, in, in, in crafting the narrative in a way that uh, you know, like make them uh, make the sales more <laughs> more probable. And I see two uh, kind of like different narratives or different main narratives. On the one hand, there is these newspapers that specifically in the case of lynchings that were targeting state officials in charge of modernizing communities. The narrative of the newspapers were that these were acts of savagery of, that reflected the backwardness of communities. And usually by backwardness, they meant that these communities were indigenous, one, and Catholic, second. No? I mean, that was the, uh, the so, so mainstream media were very strongly echoing an official narrative that said that these lynchings reflected this uh, barbarity and therefore call uh, for precisely what you were saying, like justified political interventions. No? They justified then that the state needed to come in and, and civilize these communities no? because they were using uh, lynching. Although, as I just discussed, majors, police officers were also participating in the organization. There is, however, a second uh, narrative that seems contradictory, which is that newspapers, and especially uh, Nota Roja newspapers, refer to lynchings against criminals as a form of justice that was justified. And, and, and newspapers were very critical of state authorities and their incapacity or unwillingness to punish criminals uh, in a way that, that would make crime go down. I mean, and there were callings for, you know, like the state reinstating the death penalty or even state officials using the lay fuga. No? So, so there is, it's almost like these two contradictory narratives. One that say lynching is barbaric, no? in the case of these lynchings against the modernizing forces of the state. And on the other hand, lynching as a form of justified justice uh, because the state simply wasn't using enough a harsh punishment against criminals. Uh, and then lastly, uh, just referring to the question of, uh, I think this is a very relevant question, the last one that you posed about lynchings and how they remain in collective memory and how they relate to history, because I think that this is, this is something that I wanted to emphasize in the book, that again, lynchings are not just these, you know, irrational, spontaneous events. I mean, they are deeply connected to longer histories, histories of grievances and state society relations. Um, and, and most definitely they enter into collective memory. No? I mean, and again, uh, like this town of Canoa in Puebla has had lynchings in several periods of time through, throughout the 20th century and even today. No? I mean, and, and, and people do recall these lynchings in a way and, and link them to their identity. Um, and I think, I mean, in the case, what, I think the case most 
most relevant for this kind of memorializing and, and politicizing what it means these lynchings were in the case of those that involve Catholics. No? I mean, so, so you see the Catholics of the 1930s and 1940s being the ones of the Segunda Cristiada or the Sinarchistas in the 1940s. When they are lynching socialist teachers or they are lynching Protestants, they are appealing to this longer, you know, history of the Cristeros, no? I mean, and in fact, they, many of them use the same motto, no? I mean, they use the Viva Cristo Rey when they were attacking uh, socialist Protestants in the 1930s and 1940s. And similarly, I mean, those that oppose those, those, those lynchings in the 1960s will memorialize those lynchings against socialist teachers as the same ones that are, or, or, as, or as the precursors of the, of the violence that is gonna affect students in the 1960s and will remember those as, as martyrs, no? I mean, as martyrs that are, um, that, are that need to be uh, honored and, and there are still conflicting narratives between those camps, no? I mean, between those that say that the martyrs were the socialists and those that say that the martyrs were actually the Catholics. So I think it's, 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 a, it's a story that continues to be contested. So it's quite fascinating. So thank you, Jaime, for your question. No, thank you. And I think at this point, we would like to open the, the floor and maybe we can collect two or three questions. Would that, would that work with you, Hema? Sure, sure. I, I, I see two questions in the chat. I'm not sure if oh, I should I answer those. Uh, okay. I, I think probably that would make sense. Um, a couple already in the chat. Huh? You can also <laughs> have them in our document online. Ah, I see. So chat in the document. Uh, okay. I can't handle all this. this is too much. <laughs> Why don't you let me start with the ones okay. I see in the chat, Jaime, and, and right. maybe you can pull down the document and in, yeah. in the meantime. Uh, so I see two by, uh, by Philip Johnson and by Jorge Puma. Uh, so Philip, uh, he was asking me, how can lynching inform the way we think about contemporary violence in Mexico? Narco violence seems to share features with earlier lynching, but it's often considered distinct. Can narcos engage in lynching? So, so this is a very good question. I mean, so in my, my definition of lynching uh, requires that these acts are communal. I mean, that there is a communal dimension to it. In other words, uh, uh, I mean, they are collective, they are public, they are extra legal, but also there must be a sense that members of the community support them. So can narcos engage in lynching? Surely, I mean, as long as there is a communal support. No? I mean, if, if, if narcos are seen, however, as the enemy of the community, uh, then I would, I would claim it's not a lynching, no, but it's something else. I mean, it's like, a, 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 you know, like brutal acts, I mean, collective acts of violence, but not necessarily lynching. However, I do see very, very relevant uh, connections between narco violence and lynchings, most definitely. Uh, I mean, and, and, and Philip, I know you work on narcomantas and the communicative aspects of, 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 of narco violence. And, and lynchings are highly communicative acts. I mean, they are trying to convey a message that cuts in two directions. And I think this is very similar to the violence by drug traffickers. On the one hand, they are sending a message to potential criminals or, or potential uh, uh, or, or people that are breaking the rules. No, I mean, so in the case of drug traffickers, they are also send, sending a message to either people in the community or their enemies that they shouldn't transgress certain lines of behavior. Uh, so it operates as a form of social control. No, I mean, like the this this communicative dimension, this expressive dimension of lynching is meant to impose social control, social order within giving communities. And, and I think that's a very clear connection with narco violence. The second is that similarly to drug traffickers, uh, when they use these expressive forms of violence, what they want is to call attention from the state. And similarly, perpetrators of lynching wanted the same. I mean, they wanted on the one hand to deter criminals from coming into their communities or, or people that were considered violent, but on the other, they were trying to send a very clear message to the state that if you a state, no, I mean, like, in, like that way, like in, in, in plural, I mean, or, or in general, the state, the state authorities being the police, being the, the politicians, do not do anything to punish criminals, then we will just take justice into, their own, into our own hands. Uh, importantly, what I find is that it's not just that they it's not just impunity. I mean, people were not just demanding the state to punish, but they were demanding the state in many cases, as it is today, to reinstall the death penalty. No? I mean, so lynching was 
not only a response to this lack of, of, of punishment, but also the reflected the preferences of, of people for these brutal forms of, of punishment. So, so again, I, I hope I answered your question, but I do think there are quite important connections between narco violence and lynching in terms of its communicative, expressive, uh, and even performative dimension. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Jorge, uh, he was asking, um, I wonder if the lynching of teachers could be seen as parts of acts of resistance against counterinsurgent measures of the Mexican states in former in places of former Cristero rebellion. Absolutely, no. I mean, uh, as as I was mentioning briefly, so so the lynchings against socialist teachers were uh, carried out in the con- context of the Second Cristiada, and and there were some of these. So I in in the book I discussed like there were some of these lynchings were more um, were were more sporadic and short lived. I mean, in the sense that uh, like there were perhaps like people that witnessed a teacher doing something that they consider offensive and they organized right away and tried to lynch the teacher. There were others, however, that were more clearly connected to the segunderos or to to those, um, you know, vigilantes or militants of the Second Cristiada. I mean, and there was an active collaboration between very famous uh, segun, segundero leaders, no? I mean, uh, and, and, and lynchers uh, or perpetrators of lynching on the ground. No? I mean, and this is, again, interesting because going against the grain of lynching being only spontaneous, I found that there were very interesting connections between vigilantism and, and lynching. I mean, in people that are from political science uh, and sociology, like they, they tend to put pockets into different categories of uh, lynching and vigilantism tend to be um, you know, like presented as one disorganized and one more organized, but history is more messy. And so what I find is that there's most definitely a lot of connection between the second, the, the militants of the second Cristiana or this second uprising against the secular state in Mexico and, and lynching on the ground. And, and I'm not sure, Jaime, if you were able to see the document. I haven't. Yeah. Yeah, I, I finally found it. <laughs> okay, okay, great. So, so I think uh, Anna is uh, raising a question right now. Okay. Um, but I don't think she's done articulating it. Um, let's see. There's others. Um, I'm ooh. trying to see. Well, oh, there's Joshua. Uh, I'll, I'll start with Joshua while we wait for Anna. Ah, he okay. Writes, uh, I'd mm-hmm. like to learn more about two historical uh, relations, lynching in Mexico versus the U.S., and within mm-hmm. Mexico, the historical trajectory of lynching to be to the post-revolutionary era, example in the ni- in the 1890s, public intellectuals in Mexico were already engaged in debates about the ley fuga, and would put them in terms of the le- lay the lynch. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Again, this is from from Joshua Lund. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Josh. Uh, so so yeah, this is this is a great question and gives me the chance to expand a little bit on 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 the relation between lynching in Mexico and the United States. I actually benefited greatly from the historiography of lynching in the United States, and I wish more uh, scholars that work on Latin American lynchings today would do that, um, because the historiography of lynching in the U.S. is very rich, I mean, and, 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 and offers a lot of uh, useful interpretive, interpretative tools in order to analyze lynching in a more critical way. Um, what I would say, just a couple of things, I mean, in terms of the so lynchings in the U.S. were more clearly connected to, you know, racial conflict and to, uh, to white supremacy, etc. Um, however, I mean, even though in Mexico lynchings were not uh, driven by these uh, racial conflicts, uh, they were racialized in particular ways. I mean, they were lynching was was often presented by the press as a form of indigenous justice, even though evidence suggests that lynchings were perpetrated both by indigenous and by mestizo. Uh, individuals. Uh, and ultimately, I see two, uh, two points of comparison that are very relevant between the practice in the U.S. and the practice in Mexico. One is that in both places, uh, lynching, again, is a form of social control. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a form in which, um, you know, the, the individuals from a given community are trying to assert uh, control over what are going to be the values and what are going to be the behaviors that are going to be tolerated and which ones are not going to be tolerated. So lynching is 
an instrument to make community, no? I mean, it's a way to draw the line between, or draw the boundaries between, between who belongs and who doesn't, no? And, and that's the kind of the same use that it had in the context of the United States uh, in the post-reconstruction era, no? From the 1850s or up to the 1930s when lynchings begin to decline in the United States. Another important uh, connection that I see is that lynching in Mexico, as I just explained, was also perpetrated by state actors, no? I mean, and in the United States as well, as you know, I mean, by Texas Rangers, by police officers, by mayors, marshals, no? And, and this is something that people do not talk about, but I think it's important because uh, it shows again that the Mexican state was not this uh, uh, big, overpowerful uh, uh, authority that people were not questioning, and that it is wrong to assume that this quote unquote vigilante culture uh, or frontier culture uh, all, only exists in the United States. No, I mean, it clearly has a longer history in Mexico as well. Um, and, and yeah, like I, I, I actually have a paper uh, coming out in a book uh, later on this year which reflects about representations in the press in Mexico and the US uh, between the 1890s and the 1910s uh, of lynchings. No? I mean, the ways in which Mexican, the Mexican press was saying that lynchings did not exist in Mexico, although there were uh, lynchings at the time in Mexico, and kind of portray them as, a, as, a, as a, an American exceptionalism. No? I mean, and then the, the US press uh, referring to lynchings in Mexico, uh, on the one hand, as a as, a, as an exception, no? I mean, there is this, this narrative before the 1910 Mexican Revolution where the U.S. press tended to, um, to, to portray Mexico as a, as a more lawful country, as a country where uh, the laws were, were more respected. No? So, so it's interesting. There is this common um, awareness uh, in both countries. And, and, and definitely, I mean, I should say this, the word lynching comes from the, from the, from the English word. I mean, and up to the 1930s, you have the spelling in Spanish, instead of linchamiento with an I, linchamiento is spelled with a Y. So clearly, I mean, it is uh, the origins of the use of this term in Mexico are intimately connected to the history of lynching in the United States. You know? so, so thank you, Josh. I hope I can answer your question. Yeah, and I think... Um, uh, there's a related question by Esteban mm -hmm. Salas, mm -hmm. uh, and he's, he writes, violence is violence tightly related to racial issues in the history of the Americas, especially since the 19th century, and regarding the legacies of black anti-slavery history. Uh, being the investment of the post-revolutionary state in Mexico in portraying an egalitarian society, and being the systematic state efforts to avoid um, the, uh, the categories, racial categories from official documentation since the 19th century, especially of Afro descendants and black populations. To what extent could the absence of this type of classification in your documentation represent a continuity with this tendency? Does your evidence allow for an against the grain reading of the motivations behind this type of silence, especially regarding the motivations behind some of the events of lynching? Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Esteban. I, I hope I can answer your question. I mean, I, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, so let me, let me, let me say this, like, um, as I was mentioning, lynching is not uh, driven by racial conflict in Mexico, uh, at, at least not in such an overt way as it is in the case of the United States. However, it is racialized. I mean, it is racialized in terms of the official and media discourse at the time, uh, where um, where public officials and mainstream media insisted that lynching was a form of, uh, of violence used by indigenous people, no? I mean, and, and, and they, they connected it directly to the need to civilize this, uh, this unruly, uh, uh, backward, uh, rural communities that didn't have enough education, that had been fanaticized or, or had been driven into ignorance due to the presence of priests and the Catholic Church, so, so lynching was there, was, there was indeed a racial dimension of it. And, and, and public officials, I think the, the kind of project of mestizaje of the post-revolutionary state comes out very clearly in the sense that it was the state's uh, mission to, to 
civilize these communities by mestizoi, mestizoi, by, by, by promoting mestizaje, um, uh, that, that's a difficult word, uh, by promoting mestizaje. So, so, the, so there was a function, I would say, in portraying these incidents as being indigenous, because it gave the post-revolutionary state greater legitimacy to come in with a project that clearly was trying to um, incorporate and assimilate these indigenous communities into one mestizo project, where Spanish and, 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 and culture would be the one that uh, official uh, elements were trying to promote. Okay. Um. Thank you. Thank you, Gemma. I, I have a, a question from Anna. Um, uh, could you expand on the various notations of justice that lynching in this period of Mexican history invoke? Um, okay. Um, so, Anna, I, want, uh, I, I assume notations, you mean uh, conceptions of justice or uh, some, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with that. I hope I, I can answer your question correctly. Um, so, so there was, it, it is interesting uh, because lynching again, since it's a, a, a spectacular form of violence and, and, and the newspapers were writing about it at the time, I mean, and it definitely, you know, so well, you know, this type of uh, story, allow, it's, it's a very productive entry point or a very interesting window to understand broader debates about justice and conceptions of justice in Mexico at the time. You know? and, and, and clearly, what you see in Mexico at the time is a demand for reinstating the death penalty. No? I mean, there is uh, in the public debate, not only in Nota Roja or, or in uh, alternative media, but in mainstream media, there is a demand to reinstate the death penalty. There is a leniency or a tolerance for the ley fuga. I mean, again, this uh, ley fuga was this uh, basically extrajudicial killings perpetrated by police officials uh, under the excuse that the prisoner was trying to escape. No? I mean, it was an euphemism that they were trying to escape. It was really uh, extrajudicial killings. So, so, so lynching were part of this kind of like broader demand for harsher forms of punishment that existed in post-revolutionary Mexico. In other words, it wasn't an exception. It wasn't, uh, again, the, the, the mainstream media, the mainstream press, I mean, especially like the El Nacional, the, 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 the government's mouthpiece and another uh, more mainstream newspapers such as Excelsior, El Universal, they emphasize uh, when they reported on lynchings, sometimes they said, well, this is a horrendous practice. I mean, this is, uh, this is not what, what we should be doing. However, in, in, in particular, those cases against criminals, they justify it. They justify it because they thought that the state wasn't punishing enough, that the state not only, again, were the institutions seen as, as, as weak, I mean, uh, in the sense of like the levels of impunity or the or state capacity, but it was also about the state's reluctance to apply harsher punishments. And I do want to emphasize that, no, because there is a there is, it's, it's, it's very easy to fall into this uh, state absence or a state failure narratives uh, when talking about the prevalence of lynchings. And I want to emphasize that it was not only that people and public opinion in general at the time considered that uh, the state wasn't able to punish. It was that even when the state had caught criminals, they considered that the state wasn't applying the type of corporeal, swift, lethal punishment that people demanded. No? So lynching was again kind of part of this continuum of demand for harsher punishments that included lay fuga and included the death penalty. Thank you, Gemma. Um, so we're coming close to an end, but I want to I wanna give uh, the opportunity to Professor Jose Angel Hernandez from the University of Houston. He wants to raise a question. Jose? Oh, thank you, Professor. And I just wanted to preface my question before by saying congratulations to join you in congratulating Professor Santa Maria on this fascinating book. I really hope that she continues to work on this topic because there's, it's so rich uh, in the details and the historiography. I have several questions, but I don't want to be a hog. Uh, but the, big, the main one I have is if, if Professor Santa Maria could perhaps address two other points that have been already brought up in the question, and that is about the periodization and the naming, like why the name of linchamiento mm -hmm. and why the periodization? I mean, given that, for instance, the same kinds of 
activities that she's talking about, the same modalities that she's talking about, have taken place in Mexico, at least since the colonial period. The obvious reference here is Taylor's book on drinking, homicide, and rebellion in colonial Mexican villages, where he basically lays out something similar, except he brings into the equation questions about, um, about drinking and drunkenness. Mm -hmm. And so why, why the naming of, uh, of lynching when, in some cases, you could, you could sort of notch it up as a rebellion, uh, a revolt, um, an asonada, mm -hmm. you know, et cetera. And why the periodization, given that this appears to be not only going back to the colonial period, but you even, some could argue, given your analysis, continues today. There's dozens of videos now circulating from Mexico City where these guys are trying to hold up a combi. They catch the guy in the combi, and then they, mm -hmm. they basically do a kind of a spectacle that Professor Pensado was talking about. So those are my questions. And again, congratulations, Professor. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Jose Angel Hernandez, and I will take this as my closing remarks, uh, since I know that we're running out of time. So, um, so why the term linchamientos? I absolutely agree. I mean, uh, Taylor's work, uh, like many of the instances that he describes as riots, are, are, are actually lynchings. Um, and, and I use the term basically following my sources. No? I mean, this is the way in which people began to refer to these acts. And I have traced the history of the use of, usage of the term in Mexico, and it goes back to the 1890s, uh, more or less. I mean, that's when the term uh, is introduced in, in the Mexican press. That's where it appears as more prevalent. And I think, again, it's not a coincidence that this is the year when this begins to happen. Uh, it has directly to do with the visibility of, the, of lynchings taking place in the United States. And, and actually, at the beginning, many of the press accounts that I found uh, had to do with lynchings taking place in the United States, e either against African Americans or against Mexican uh, Mexican uh, people or people of Mexican origin, and the press is criticizing these acts. Um, so again, this is the way in which people began to refer to this has completely to do with the greater visibility of the history of lynching in north of the border of Mexico. No, it's completely linked to the history of lynching of the United States. Although I agree, and I, and I do discuss that a little bit in my methodological footnotes, uh, in terms of like the, the term itself uh, it has very a lot of similarities to, to rioting and, and certainly lynching did not emerge in Mexico in the post-revolutionary period, but has, as you rightly saw, uh, said, uh, a longer history that goes back to the colonial times and that continues today. So why this period? I was very interested in analyzing the post-revolutionary period because because of two reasons. One, because in the historiography of Mexico, these years, I mean, especially in the 1940s and 1950s, but also it could be said about the Cardenista years, had traditionally been seen as these uh, golden years of stability. I mean, these are seen as the years in which the, the priest the regime was able to institutionalize violence. At the macro level, you have a decline in levels of homicides. So the, the dominant narrative was, uh, that Mexico had experienced a decline in levels of violence and that violence became more institutionalized, more, uh, more, more civil, like less visible, less spectacular. You know, the, we left behind the years of the revolution, we left behind the years, the years of the Cristero War. However, like as I have shown, that's not the case. No? So I was really interested in taking a, a, a period that has been traditionally been presented as one of stability and, and lower levels of violence and show how actually these were very much violent years. Uh, and, and again, through lynching, that is a form of violence that doesn't fit into bottom down, bottom up or top down characterizations. Uh, the second uh, reason why I wanted to study this period is I actually began to study lynchings by looking at present day cases. And I was struck by the fact that many sociologists and political scientists claimed that lynchings were a new phenomenon that had to do with the process of democratization, with neoliber neoliberalism that happened in the 1980s, 1990s in Mexico. And that said that lynching was the result of the absence of a state, a crisis in the, in the, in the priesta regime, a, a crisis in the type of presence that the priesta regime used to have before the 1980s. So I was interested in showing that, as a matter of fact, lynchings were not a result of the absence of the state or the crisis of, of, of state authority or priesta regime authority. They were a result. They, were, they are a symptom of how authority was forged in Mexico, precisely in the golden years, 
of the post-revolutionary or the pre eastern regime. No? So, so I was interested in tracing this period for those two reasons. And, and thank you so much for, uh, for I'm going to just give my closing remarks by saying a big thank you to everybody that joined me today in these special circumstances. I appreciate it even more. It has been a pleasure to be able to share my work with you. And, and I am and please feel free to email me, contact me. I am more than happy to continue talking uh, with, with everybody about this project. And Jaime, thank you so much for your comments. Denise and everyone at the Kellogg, thank you so much for allowing me to be here. Yeah, and I won't add much because we're out of time, but I wanna thank you as well for sharing your work. And I wanna thank everyone for joining us, if at least this way, and hopefully we can do this again. Uh, with your future books on lynching back here at <laughs> Kellogg. Uh, so thank you everyone. And please, I encourage you to reach out to, to Hema with additional questions. And I apologize if I didn't get to your specific questions, but again, thank you all. And special thank you uh, to Hema. <laughs>